And would you please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll be, our message will begin in verse 8, but we'll be looking at the context uh, from, from verse 1. So we'll go back and read from verse 1 in a moment. But, uh, I, you know, as I, as I, uh, as people find out I've lived in Alaska and that kind of thing, I'm often asked, oh, how did you get along with six months of dark and six months of light? Well, that's not, that, that's not true. That's not true. That's not even true as far north as you can go. It's not six months and six months. It's just like our days. Our days change and go back and forth. But, but uh, uh, you know, we, we know lengthening days and shortening of days. But it is interesting that in Barrow, which is 300 and some miles in the northern part of Alaska, in the, that the days that, that they have more days of light than they do of dark. They have about 80 days where it's light, the sun never sets, and only 67 days where the sun is, is uh, they never see the sun. Uh, you say, big deal, I, w I couldn't handle that darkness, right? And uh, that's, that's kind of where I'm looking at here, this idea of, of daylight and, and dark, or light and dark, because uh, this idea of darkness usually has some connotations to it. And uh, in fact, there is a SAD, uh, seasonal uh, uh, something uh, oh, disorder, and it's called SAD, of course, where you're affected by the seasonal changes, seasonal affective disorder, I think that's what it is. And uh, you're affected by the changes that are, uh, that might impact, uh, you know, impact you by the seasons, and, and uh, like depression, and uh, just, just being down and discouraged and that kind of thing. But I, I'll let you know that uh, uh, most of those n don't necessarily happen in Alaska, all right? And they happen around the, around the country, around the world, that kind of thing. But sometimes light can make a difference. And I don't know how that all works, but, but uh, the idea of having light uh, is kind of an, uh, helps that affect type thing. Now, of course, some of us, we might have a bad day and we might feel kind of depressed and down and, you know, whatever. But we're talking about something different. But uh, does, does anyone, anyone here have an idea of light or darkness, excuse me? Do you have a good view of darkness? I mean, what's your favorite thing about darkness? Well, stars, okay. But what are you looking at? You're looking at the light, aren't you? Yeah, okay. But yeah, that's cool. I, I, it, the night sky, night, night sky type thing, yeah. But you know, usually if we say we talk about dark, don't we? It's usually on the negative. What? Caves are black. The caves are black. Yeah, I think that's kind of one of those pictures I got. That darkness of a cave. That's probably you've been in a cave and have the, have them turn out the lights. That's probably one of the darkest places you can be. You know, I mean, just dark, 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 dark. You know, I can kind of fumble my way around my house a little bit in the dark. But it's never dark, dark, dark. The thermostat has a light or the dishwasher has a light. You know, there's just some little, you know, and then there's usually a little twilight or a little something like that. But darkness is usually thought of as very negative, isn't it? It's usually very negative. Well, in the scriptures, it's negative as well. In the scriptures, it's negative. And, and in fact, uh, it's usually talked about as as sin is associated with darkness, and and uh, you might know, you might be familiar with the wordless book where where uh, you know the the darkness of sin. The dark page represents sin, and and there's a little song. I don't know if I don't know if I've ever sung the uh, the wordless book song, and I'm not gonna try to. Uh, oh shoot, it is recorded. Uh oh, uh, but it, it goes. You know, my heart was dark with sin. Until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has washed me white as snow. All right. Isn't that a cool... I mean, that's a cool reminder. But what, what, where does it start? It starts with the idea of darkness. It starts with that idea of darkness and the darkness of sin and that connection. And, and today, what we're going to see in our, in our Scriptures today is we're going to see that contrast between darkness and light. We're going to see the difference, and, and we're going to find a challenge in this passage to that, that I hope would draw you, a passage that would just, that this passage would just draw you to the Lord, draw you to the light of the Lord. 
So let's read, beginning in verse 1, follow along with me, Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to break it up briefly, but therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And uh, you might have noticed from the, from the title page here, we, we, the, there's a theme that we're looking at through this chapter, fit followers. King James uses the word followers here. This one has the word imitators. If you looked at it in the Greek, you could easily see the word mimic. The word mimic would come out of this word. Be imitators of God. And so this flows through the context. As dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and, get, and given us himself, given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know, verse 5 says, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an adulterer has any inheritance in the kingdom of God or Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. That's the plea that Paul is saying. You want to be a follower of God? Don't follow. Be a follower of God. Don't follow the world around you and the, those that are destined to God's wrath. Don't follow that. Be a follower of God. Be an imitator of God. And then as we, as we, move, so as we look at this, we're going to see the idea of, of light as we, as we go on because, you know, if we're going to be a follower of God, and I know this is a puny light and I don't want to shine it in your eyes or anything, but I want to get the idea of light. The scriptures tell us God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Wow. No darkness at all. You know, we got the lights on here. But, you know, we find some shadows in the corner or under the pew or whatever it is. In him there is no darkness at all. Keep that tucked away in your mind as we go on and we read the next section here, verse, verse 8 through 10, where our message is going to come from. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And so we see this idea in this context about light and darkness. It's just a simple, simple idea, but of, of light and darkness, but God is the light, and, and those without God have no light. They are dark. And we're going to see this contrast but what I, want to, what I want to bring out to you as a whole is I want to bring out the command that we have in, in verse 8. There is this one command that says, walk in the light. Now he's talking, he's not talking about people who are still in darkness and telling them, oh, try to shape up and walk in the light. That's not what he's doing. And so we need, to, we need to recognize that this passage is addressed to people who have already allowed the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their lives and that they are now light in the Lord. In other words, if you, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin, if you're trusting Him, then He has done a work in you where you are, you are light. Now the challenge is to be a follower to be an imitator of God like his children. And that's the challenge, that's the key thing that we're going to bring out in our context. So when, I, when we say this command here, he's not just telling all the world, you better walk in darkness. He's addressing believers. He's addressing those who know Jesus Christ as Savior, and he says, you are light, so why don't you walk that way? Why don't you reflect who you are? Why don't you live like who you are rather than allowing the world to influence you and, and live in, in something else? And so the command, the command, and I'm going to use the word light in all three points of my outline, and we're going to, but we're going to see the command is walk. I'm going to zero in on that first of all. You walk, 
That's the command. And in the present tense in the Greek, it has the idea to let this be continuous. This is to be something that never ends, never stops as in the life of a believer. To walk in the light. To walk in the light. That's the command that's given here. But again, remember, it's only to believers. We, we can't expect an unbeliever, someone who is in the dark, to walk, to walk like, to even look like they are, they're in the light. We can't expect that. And so this isn't just some religious thing that you, oh, I'm going to try to walk in the light today. No. This is for those who know Jesus Christ who are depending upon him. You have that responsibility because God has made something, a difference in your life. Walk in the light. And this sense of walking is the idea of living. We've seen that several times already. As we turn the page from Ephesians chapter 3 into chapter 4, we see that practical idea coming forth. That practical idea, he begins there in, ver in chapter 4 and verse 1. It was our memory verse before where he says to walk worthy of your calling. Walk worthy of your calling where God has called you. God has called you, so walk worthy of that. So you turn the page from chapter 3, and you immediately in chapter 4, it's about, all right, now let's live up to all that we've studied about in, in chapters 1, through and three, 1, 2, and 3. Live that out. Let that impact you in a very practical way in the way that you live. And so he says, walk in our context. And uh, we, saw it, we saw it in verse 2, walk in love. You can back up into chapter 4, verse 1, of course, and verse 17, where we saw don't walk like the Gentiles. We have that same kind of an idea flowing from, from this context. Followers of God. Followers of God ought to have a distinctive walk. We ought to have, we ought to have, ought to have a distinctive walk. And there's all sorts of illustrations we could probably draw from that. But uh, as I was just pondering this idea, and I, I've been reading some in the Old Testament, and uh, I, I wrote down just several illustrations, but the one that stuck with me that I want to leave with you today as a challenge is Joshua. Joshua's last words to Israel, shortly before he died, he gathered them together and I want you to get the picture of where they were. John, the, the children of Israel were in the promised land. They were in the promised land. They had conquered enough to where everybody had some inheritance. I, can you imagine them? I, I imagine them on kind of a high. Man, the, the people had just melted away before them because they'd done so, you know, God had given them great victories. They were on a high. And Joshua comes up and Joshua's last words are, choose you this day whom you will serve. Why does he do that? Can't you imagine them saying, we're okay, Joshua. God just gave us the land. We're okay. How many Christians, and I've heard that exact phrase, where they've said, oh, I'm okay because I have forgiveness in Christ. I know I'm a Christian. But let me challenge you that just being okay doesn't mean you're a follower of God. It doesn't mean you're a follower of God. He's going deeper. And we, we mentioned this as we began chapter 5. Maybe a little bit of a difference from chapter 4 to chapter 5 where, where, was, where we have this relational type thing. This is more relational, where he's, where he's challenging them to walk, imitate, and walk in this way, to walk in the light. And so I want to I challenge you with this, this comment here that he makes, this command, to allow yourself to, and maybe examine yourself, and you say, wow, am I really walking in the light? Or do I just kind of shrug and say, oh, I'm okay. Allow the word of God to grip you. And this, you know, to walk in the light takes total dependence upon him. To walk in the light, there aren't going to be any shadowy corners. It takes some self-examination. But it takes total dependence upon him. Even for eyes to see as well as power to perform. 
It takes a total dependence upon him. And we'll see another verse as we go on. So let me challenge you, if you get nothing today, choose you this day. Don't wait till tomorrow. Choose you this day. So that's the command, and it's based on the fact that we were. We were. Let me go back and read the verse here, verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And so the sense is, so walk as children of light. And that was the command, but it's based on the fact of the reminder that you, who you were. You were dark. You were dark. And it's not that just that you were in the dark, or for you Star Wars fans, on the dark side. Okay, I should have been, got my Darth Vader voice on, right? Dark side. Anyway, anyway. you know, it's, it's not that. Notice it's not that. It is that you were dark. Our world today does not believe in the depravity of man. Our world, does, our world, if you listen very long to anything anywhere that the world comes up with, and they will, in a sense, say there's some light or some good in everyone. That's not scripture. The scripture says we're all dark. We were dark. You know, we don't have too many. We, if, if we could somehow shut all these lights off, I know we can't, you know. We can't, but we'd never get going again, you know, by the time some of these. But you can imagine it. Imagine the cave-like darkness. And he says, you were dark. God often does this. He brings us back to where we were so that we see the glory of the light, the glory of his grace. And here he does it again. He brings us back to dark, dark, dark. In this context, in the context that we find ourselves here, it would be the, peop the things and the people that are listed in verses 3 to 5. Fornication and, fornication and fornicators are dark. Uncleanness and unclean ones are dark. Covetousness and covetous people are dark. Foolishness and foolish talk, or, or filthiness and foolish talk, crude humor. They're dark, dark, dark. Not this yet, but the dark, the darkness of the dark heart. The dark we saw in the previous verses are headed to wrath, but the saints aren't. Saints are headed to, to God's glory. We've been rescued from the wrath to come. If we compare Ephesians chapter 2, let's just take a quick peek back there. I think he probably has this even in mind. Ephesians chapter 2. And just notice how he, how he says this. And by the way, if you have he made alive in verse 2, that's not in, uh, or verse 1, I mean, that's not in the Greek at all, in any Greek text. But he says, so I'm going to skip it. It's italics. And you who were, oh, were, 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 just like we had. Just like our content, you were dark. He says, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Who's that? Satan. You were gripped by Satan. How bad? Among whom we all conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. Ooh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath. This is what we were. We were destined to wrath. We were influenced in all that. And then verse 4. Don't you love verse 4 here? But God... But God, who is rich in mercy. How rich? Well, we said he's loaded beyond, beyond comprehension. He's rich, he's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead. Boy, he just can't get away from that, can he? We were dead. We were in that darkness. We were dead in sin. What did he do? He made us alive together with Christ and saved us by his grace. Amen? Oh, 
Saved us by his grace. It's not our doing. It's not our doing. It's his grace. That's how he saved us. You can't take, you can't take the, the darkness, the dark heart, you can't get rid of that on, our, on your own. Religion tries it all the time. And all they're doing is putting a band-aid on it. I know when I'm talking to kids sometime and we talk about the gospel, you know, even if we even if we add a little light to the subject, what's still there? Sin. The sin problem is still there. The sin problem is still there. We can't get rid of it on our own. It's only by the death of Jesus Christ that we are we are washed clean, that we are light in the Lord. Come on back to our context here. In uh, actually, I'll, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a verse to you. You might want to jot this down if I don't have it. But I'm gonna give you another one. Second Corinthians four four. I'm gonna read it quickly here to you. It says, speaking about those who are perishing in verse three, he says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. The God of this age, Satan. Same word for age and things back in Ephesians two. He's blinded them who do not believe lest the light, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan wants the unbelieving world in the dark. He never wants to see that change. Never wants to see that dependence upon the cross of Christ. He never wants to see that. He wants to leave, leave men in their darkness. But that's where we were. You see that? That past tense? You were dark. Come on back to Ephesians 5 if you haven't. And look at the rest of that verse. He says, he says you were darkness, but now. I love that. But now you are light in the Lord. You're not light on your own. You're light in the Lord. The light comes from the Lord. The, the, he changed you from the dark to the light. He made, he made that change. But now, man. And you stop and think of it in just so many other terms. You know, we were dead, but now we're alive. We were dark, but now we're light. You were out in a sense. Ephesians 2.11 has this but now idea. You were out, but now you're in. And uh, over and over we could say you were, you were believing the lie, but now you believe the truth. You were blinded, but now you're seeing the gospel. You were in sin, but now you're forgiven. You were sinners, and now you're saints. And we could just go on and on and on. Because we have a new identity in Christ. And that identity is absolute, irrevocable, unchangeable, and eternal in Him. It's eternal in Him. So, you were dark, you're now light. What's the command? Live like it. Walk. Continuously, forever, walk like who you are. Let your life be light-like. Let your life be light-like. And in case you don't know what that's like, verse 9 tells us. He says, for the fruit of the Spirit, or some of you have the fruit of light. I'm not going to argue about the... There's a difference in the Greek text, some Greek text. I'm not even going to argue with that. But the point is, is that to live light-like, to have the light-type emphasis that we have in this context of righteousness, goodness, righteousness, and truth, to have those things, the Spirit has to enable those anyway. The Spirit has to empower, empower those things. He has to empower anything worthwhile in our lives. And he says the fruit of the light, or the fruit of the Spirit. Scripture always uses that idea of fruit, doesn't it? It uses it many, many places just in... Jesus used parables of the wheat and the tares and, and the fig trees and the olive trees. And you have this all through the scripture, that idea of fruit, fruit coming from the tree and that kind of a thing. And uh, last year when we were in Ephesus, uh, one of the first things I noticed, I, I asked, the, we were driving to the motel and I asked, are those olive trees? Yeah, 
Those were all olive trees. All over the place there were olive trees. There were olive trees that were groomed and taken care of, and then there were neglected ones, and we walked on their fruit on the sidewalk. But I sure liked those, uh, that buffet table that had uh, olives that I could have all, all my fill of olives. I like olives, huh? You know, I mean, there were, there were dark ones and green ones, and there were, I mean, there, was, there were, I don't know how many olives, even for breakfast. I'd never had olives for breakfast before. But there were all, you know, what is, it's the fruit of the tree. What, is, what are we saying here? The fruit of the tree, and he says this fruit is identified. Notice what he's not doing. He's not naming the fruit. You know that? Notice that? It's in all. It's in this realm. It's in this sphere. It's in this connection. This fruit, no matter what kind of fruit, no matter what it looks like, no matter if it looks like an olive or an apple, I mean, we're talking about fruit in our lives. He says it's in this realm of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. He's identifying characteristics of this fruit. You know, and, and uh, there might be something in your life where God is using you, God is working through you, and you might not find an exact verse to say that, well, you're not going to find an exact verse for what what a couple of our guys are doing right now with computers and, and uh, running the PowerPoint and that kind of, you're not going to find that in the scripture. Thou shalt run the PowerPoint, you know. <laughs> First of all, they wouldn't have a thou in front of it, right? You know, and, uh, you know, in the modern day. I mean, you're not going to find that. But what is it? It has, it has the fruit of goodness. It has the fruit of righteousness. It has the fruit of truth. In other words, it... It's in this, in this auspices of these things. It's good, not bad. It's, it's good always. Just like the, there is no darkness in him at all, when you, when you get the fruit, it's always in the light. It's good fruit. It's not bad. It's always there. It's not just being good. It's God working in us. And righteousness, it's not, it's right, it's not wrong, ever. It's not man's standard, it's God's standard. Because God is producing it. It's truth, it's not false, ever. And it's truth before man, and it's truth before God. It's true, because it aligns with the Word of God. As we walk in the light, the fruit of that walk will be light-like. And you could say, yeah, now we're not going to see some glowing thing, you know. We're not going to see something glow. But in a, in a sense, maybe we should see goodness kind of glow out of us. We should see righteousness glow out of us. We should see truth glow out of us. Light-like. Because we're followers of God. You know, it's easy to kind of take some of these things and kind of say, good, oh, they're, they're so good. And we miss the idea, no, this is absolute goodness, not a shadow, not a shadow. And like the fruit of the Spirit, it's not human produced, it's God produced, it's Spirit produced working in us. That's the measure of what it means to imitate God. This is how we tell if we're imitating God, if we're following God. And so the challenge to us is, are these things in my walk? If they are, then it's going to flow right into verse 10, and I'm going to use the, the word proving. <coughs> proving. That sense in verse 10 you know, did you, I think probably, does anyone have a translation that does not have a parentheses around verse 9? I bet nobody does. I checked the major ones. They all have parentheses, and I think what it's doing is so that when you get to the proving in verse 10, you can connect it to the walk. He left us off in verse 8. He said, walk as children, walk in the light, proving... Now, we know that the standard is in verse 9, righteousness and, and goodness, righteousness and truth. So we, we have that standard, but he puts that in the middle in parentheses to give us the idea 
that our walk is to demonstrate, our walk is to prove, it's to, it's to pass the test. Our walk pass, passes the test. This word for proving here, uh, you see I got some pictures of mine, miners or mines there. The word, it, it, this is a word used for assaying metals. You know, you, you get the metal and you determine, you, de you determine whether it's got gold or silver or both or, or some other minerals in that. You know, the old, you remember the old movies where the uh, prospector, we'd bite down on a nugget, right? Yeah. You know, if I'd bite down on my ring right now, I'd probably break a tooth because it's not pure gold. It's not pure gold. The old, the old uh, miners, they'd take a little, in a little, uh, oh yeah, they could dent that gold coin or that gold nugget and they knew it was real. They knew it was real instead of pyrite or whatever, you know. And uh, then they would sell their mines, you know, and they'd say, yeah, I got, I got high grade stuff here. You know, maybe they, but, you know, assaying is more of a science. The assayer's office would give you the breakdown exactly what's in the ores and that kind of thing. And if he says it's high grade, it makes the owner smile. This is high grade stuff. This is worth a lot. It's a good producer. It's high grade. You know what? If our lives are proving what is well pleasing, who's smiling? It's God. It's well pleasing to God. Nine out of the ten times this word well-pleasing is used, sometimes it's translated acceptable, but nine of the ten times it's used of pleasing the Lord. One of the most common ones that you might know would be Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. The word acceptable is well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, same word we have here, prove up that which is good and well-pleasing to the Lord. That's what it takes. Lord, here I am. And there's many other verses where we see this idea. But let me challenge you with the idea. Does your walk prove up does your walk prove up to be high grade? Does it prove up to be high grade? Does it make God smile? I don't know what kind of picture you want to get out of this, con, but does it make God smile? Because it's well pleasing and he, he looks behind, you know, because we're followers. He looks behind and he sees you following. Is it well pleasing? Is it well pleasing? I pray that maybe you could maybe challenge yourself today to make that Joshua type determination. This day, this day is the day that I'll be a follower. Today, I'm gonna be serious and allow God to make a change. Heavenly Father, as we're praying here today, we just pray that our hearts would be attuned to you and your will, your light. I pray that, that we're not just kind of going through the motions even with a prayer, but that we're talking to you in our heart of hearts and saying, Lord, I want to make you smile for your glory this day. Amen.